So, as you know, um, what I'm going to be talking about for the next uh, at least one hour, um, it's very rare that we're told, don't stop talking, make sure you keep talking uh, for an hour, but this is the way the world of uh, CLE works. Uh, as you know, what I'm going to be talking about is the Hobby Lobby case and uh, putting it in some context, particularly putting it in the context of Citizens United and how those two cases fit together and making an argument that its effects may be a little bit different from what uh, people on both sides of the political spectrum think or at least think when or thought when um, when the case first came out. Um, I'm grateful that Dale precisely identified what my particular expertise is. I'm a corporate law guy um, among other things, and less of a, a con law guy, um, you can't talk about Hobby Lobby or Citizens United without doing a little bit of both. But if you all ask me tough questions about constitutional law, I'm either going to look over at Dale or I'm going to say I don't know. And so what you're going to get is a corporate law centered uh, take on, on uh, Hobby Lobby, which is, I, I think, the right take on Hobby Lobby and at least one set of its uh, implications. Whoops. Um, so, y'all have all seen these things, I'm sure. When Hobby Lobby came out, there was very excited reaction from both sides of the political spectrum. So Sandra Fluke, uh, the Georgetown law student who became famous because she was smeared um, by, uh, by right-wing media a little bit, um, uh, in the context of, of Obamacare, wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post. I wrote, uh, we both wrote op-eds in the, in the Washington Post online uh, the day after Hobby Lobby came out. Hers showed up in the paper and was downloaded about three million times. Uh, I haven't checked to see how many times mine was downloaded, not quite as much. But she said, uh, corporations are not people, corporations cannot have religious views, and this decision sends us in a dangerous direction. Robert Reich, who was the labor secretary in the Clinton administration, writing another op-ed, said bestowing freedom of religion about personhood, the corporate personhood, and how that's been understood uh, historically in this country, equally quickly about constitutional rights for corporations, which rights do they have so far, which do they not have. Then I'm going to talk about, uh, about Citizens United a little bit, particularly the corporate side of that, what the, what the Supreme Court said with respect to corporations and free speech. Then Hobby Lobby, um, and an interesting question that came out of Hobby Lobby, and that is when can a publicly held corporation have religious freedom rights? As most people here probably know, Hobby Lobby was a closely held corporation. It's a big corporation, but it's, it's family held. And the Supreme Court spoke specifically to the context of family held, closely held, not necessarily family held, closely held corporations. One of the questions on everybody's minds is what does that mean for publicly held um, corporations? So I'm going to talk some about that. If we have enough time when I'm talking about that, I want to put it into the context of current theories of corporate governance, different views about how we should think about corporate governance. If we run out of time or if we're running low on time, I might uh, cut that short. That's mostly for corporate law um, nerds like Brad and me, um, to, and maybe for corporate law students who are interested in corporate law, maybe people who are practicing um, corporate law. And then fairly quickly at the end, I will uh, give you what I promised in the title to this talk, and that is, what is there to like about Hobby Lobby from a conservative perspective, and what is there to like about Hobby Lobby from a, um, a liberal perspective? And I, and I think there are bits to like um, from both perspectives. So that's where I'm going, um, starting with the context and uh, the contact, the beginning of the context is the, the history of corporate personality. If you're interested in this, there was a long standing debate uh, in the US and in Europe. Uh, very, very good article on this. I think, it's, I think it's a terrific article by a guy named Ron Harris. Um, part of the title is Corporate Personality Theories. It's an article that came out in 2006. 
and he traces the genealogy of these three different understandings of the nature of a corporation. The understandings in the US came from Europe. They came ultimately primarily from Germany, in some cases by way of England. Um, so very briefly, the, the three theories. The first theory is known as concession theory. That was the theory that you would probably say prevailed at the time of the, the founding of the US um, Republic, at the time the Constitution was placed, uh, put in place in the early years of, uh, of the Republic. Concession theory is the idea that corporations have only the powers that are given to them by the state. Um, it's sometimes called grant theory, that corporations have whatever life and whatever authority is given to them by the state. They are creatures of the state. The second theory, aggregate theory, is more of a contractual theory. Um, it came a little later. Uh, its influence came a little later to the U.S., later in the well into the 19th century. Um, uh, aggregate theory is based on the idea that a corporation is a reflection of the views of the people who, who formed it, and it is contractual in nature. So aggregate theory tends to think of, of corporations as, as contractual creatures. Then finally, the last theory of the corporation to have an influence in the US, and this was not until I think the beginning of the fairly early in the 20th century, is known as real entity um, theory. And the idea there, oversimplifying as I have with each of these theories, is that the corporation has some kind of independent existence. It's not simply what the state granted it, as concession theory suggests. It's not simply the contractual relations among the, the folks who, who form the corporation. The corporation has some sort of real existence, real independent uh, existence. The Supreme Court cases on what constitutional rights corporations have, to some extent, reflect the court's shifting views as to which of these theories best characterizes the nature of a corporation. Um, I should say um, that, and I forget exactly when this, this, uh, this article was, there was an article by the philosopher John Dewey uh, in the early 20th century, I think it was 1926 or thereabouts, essentially saying, as John Dewey said about many things, that these theories of the corporation are a bunch of crock, that, um, that you can reach any conclusion about any particular issue from any of the theories, and you can mix, mix and match your theories, and they don't really have independent significance, said John Dewey. The effect of that um, article was to, to kill corporate personhood discussion in the United States, at least, pretty much uh, almost for the rest of the 20th century. So in Germany and England, um, people still talk about theories of the corporation and why they matter, uh, theories of, of corporate personhood and why they matter. After the Dewey article in the US, there was almost no scholarly literature on this um, at all. A little bit of a scholarly literature has reemerged in the last few years, but in a, in a very different place. Um, so, so one bit of the scholarly literature is simply historical, such as the Ron Harris um, article. And Ron Harris tries to revitalize these theories a little bit. He, he gives their intellectual lineage but he also argues that it does matter which theory you're operating under, and uh, your theory of the corporation does shape to some extent the way you conceive um, of the corporation. The other line of recent work, and this is again, most of the beginning of part of this talk is, is, is for corporate nerds. Uh, although if you get interested in if you get interested in this stuff, I would recommend reading the Ron Harris article and the John Dewey article. The John Dewey article is great. It's a short, um, short, well written article. But more recently there's been a bunch of work by Henry Hansman, who's a law professor at Yale, Rainier Crackman, who's a law professor at Harvard, 
reconceptualizing what the significance of the corporation is. They're not debating philosophical theories of the corporation, but the question they ask is, why does the corporation matter? Why does it matter that we have something we call a corporation that, ha that has the properties that it has? And the argument they make in a series of articles is, that the entity status really matters for a variety of reasons. Like the fact that a corporation is a separate entity, separate from the shareholders, um, allows you to do things that you wouldn't um, otherwise be uh, able to do. Um, and I don't want to get too much into the details of this because that really would be getting into to corporate nerd um, land, although these articles are very interesting. Um, Margaret Blair, who's a law professor at Vanderbilt, wrote an article that was kind of shaped by the, the Hansman and Crackman work, where she did a historical analysis of corporations and what was going on with them in the 19th century. And she argued that the entity status of the corporation is essential and the kinds of benefits it provides, one of the main benefits it provided was continuity through time. If the folks who had gotten together to start a business, if one of them died or filed for bankruptcy or gotten divorced, got divorced, and they were, uh, and their business was a partnership, the business would be dismembered as the result of the death or the divorce or, um, or uh, uh, the other, whatever, uh, or the bankruptcy, the other uh, development uh, with respect to either the business or, um, or the partners. Benefit of the corporate form is that the entity was not, would not be dismembered if one of the partners died or one of the, the formers died or divorced um, or filed for, for bankruptcy. And so corporations allowed people to bring assets together <laughs> that were more valuable together than they would be if they were dismembered. This, uh, the assets could stay together and have all the synergies of the ongoing business through time despite these disruptions. And, and Margaret Blair argued that that is, is one of the essential contributions um, of the corporation. One of the things I want to say, picking up on, on this, is simply that whichever, however you understand the evolution of the corporation, I, I think there is something to the entity status. And one of the, the suggestions in some of the literature is that a corporation is simply a reflection of the people who started the corporation, simply a reflection of the, the shareholders. I don't think that ultimately is a plausible theory of what a corporation is, and that's going to be part, um, that's going to inform the part of what I have to say about, um, about Hobby Lobby. Okay, so I've gone through a whole bunch of stuff really fast, not giving you enough detail to figure out what I'm talking about, so I'll try to, um, I'll try to give you a little bit more, um, more detail and maybe even stop and see if anybody have, has questions in. Um, in just a minute. Um, so the next thing that I want to just go through really quickly is the constitutional rights of corporations and where, um, and where that stands more or less. This is really just a quick and dirty and not complete overview. But a lot of people trace the debate about the constitutional rights uh, of, of the corporation to a case, a Supreme Court case called Santa Clara County from 1868. And what Santa Clara County did in a, in a almost backhanded way is suggest that the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment applies to corporations. It wasn't really central to the decision, and there's been a lot of writing about how the idea of uh, equal protection applying to corporations emerged out of Santa Clara, but people usually trace it to the Santa Clara case, um, which suggests that at least that constitutional right applies to corporations. After that, over the, the 100 years after that, there have been a number of other cases asking what other rights corporations do or don't have. And so a very quick, short list of them. Corporations do not have a right um, against self-incrimination, a Fifth Amendment right. Um, the idea of the Supreme Court has said 
that corporate that the right of self-incrimination get self-incrimination is inherently a right of individuals. It's not a right that a corporation as a corporation can exercise. So corporations don't have that right. Corporations do, however, uh, says the Supreme Court, have due process rights. They have Fourth Amendment rights with respect to searches and seizures. The government has to get a warrant to search a, um, a corporation, as would be the case with an individual. Corporations also have a uh, right, Seventh Amendment right, to a jury trial. So um, the, the Supreme Court has concluded that a, uh, at least one constitutional right, the right against self-incrimination, does not apply to corporations. It has concluded that a number of others do apply to corporations. What we are talking about now a lot, of course, is two other rights, and that is uh, free speech rights, and what, to what extent do corporations have free speech rights. That's the Citizens United case and its predecessors. There's a whole line of cases leading up to Citizens United. Um, and then more recently, the question whether corporations have religious freedom rights to some extent under the First Amendment, um, but more under a statute, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, RIFRA, and a successor statute, statute to RIFRA. Um, that is what Hobby Lobby is about. So these are the two things I'm going to talk about primarily, uh, free speech under Citizens United and religious freedom um, and what Hobby Lobby has to say about that. So I've talked in one loud, breathless um, stream of words. Uh, I'm going to stop because there's going to be kind of a shift in what I'm talking about here and ask, are there any questions at this point? Um, maybe I'll summarize what, I, what I'm trying to say at this point. So um, in the 19th century, there was a huge amount of debate about the philosophy of the corporation and exactly what a corporation is. Um, by, the, by the early 20th century, there were three major theories um, that were imported primarily from Germany, um, is where a lot of this theory developed. And in Germany, these theories are still very important, and there's still a great deal of discussion um, about them in the, in the legal uh, literature. Three theories as to what a corporation is. Uh, roughly 1926, John Dewey says um, this is a waste of time. This was at the beginning of, um, of the legal real, or it was not at the beginning, it was kind of in the middle of the legal realism um, movement in American law schools, and there was a much more pragmatic perspective on uh, issues such as the nature of the corporation, and that is reflected in in Dewey's dismissal. Uh, ideas of corporate personhood have once again become important in the corporate scholarship, and I wanted to give you at least the names, even if you can't follow what I was saying because I was, I was uh, talking so quickly. So that's where we are, and uh, that puts us in a position to talk about what I really want to talk about, and that is um, Citizens United and Hobby Lobby. So Citizens United, um, the context of the case was it was a small organization called, uh, called Citizens United that was a corporation that had financed a film called Hillary the Movie. Um, I'm tempted to ask if anybody's ever seen Hillary the Movie. Uh, I've, not, um, I've never seen it, but it was a little movie about Hillary, um, and as you can imagine, it was not a flattering, it was not a campaign biopic um, about Hillary. It's not the kind of stuff that the Clinton campaign is putting together right now. Um, it, was, it was about how dangerous a Hillary Clinton presidency would be to America. Um, and it was, I think it was like about a 30 minute uh, little video. It was available online, and Citizens United was worried that this video would violate the uh, McCain-Feingold restrictions. The McCain-Feingold uh, campaign finance law is, is, is the formal name is Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act of 2002. Um, so Citizens United was worried that showing their little uh, movie about 
about Hillary, I think it was in Wisconsin. It was, uh, it was within uh, 30 days, or there's a window before a presidential primary. I think it was within 30 days of the Wisconsin presidential primary um, that they wanted to show it. They were afraid it would violate the campaign finance law, and so they sued um, to ch and challenged, uh, challenged at least the application of the campaign finance law to them um, and possibly the campaign finance law in general with respect to what it says about um, what are known as independent expenditures. Um, and there's a lot of discussion in the, in the first part of, of Citizens United about whether the Supreme Court has to, whether it needs to address the constitutional uh, issue and how it needs to address the constitutional issue. Supreme Court uh, Justice Kennedy decision sort of just swats all that to the side and says, we have to take this, um, this head on. And what the question is, is whether it is permissible to restrict independent campaign um, expenditures, independent expenditures by a, um, a for-profit corporation. And so, um, this one, it was not. It was not about direct contributions to somebody's campaigns. It was about expenditures that were for or against electioneering expenditures for for or against the candidate. In this case, the candidate was Hillary um, Clinton. Um, so that's the context of the decision. The court, as I said, decides not to decide it on narrow grounds, concludes it needs to uh, address the issue whether a for-profit corporation um, um, can be restricted in its ability to, uh, to make independent expenditures. And the Supreme Court says no, that these restrictions are a violation of the First Amendment free speech rights of Citizens United. And in the process, the most dramatic thing the court does is it overrules one of its earlier campaign finance cases, a case called Austin. And it rejects each of the arguments that Austin had used for, uh, to justify restricting the ability of corporations to make uh, independent expenditures, expenditures that are designed to promote or undercut a campaign in the context. Well, um, uh, actually, it wouldn't be limited to, to an election, but in this context, the, the, uh, the issue had to do with, with election-related independent um, expenditures. So uh, let me just run through quickly the three rationales and what the Supreme Court said about them. So the first was an anti-distortion rationale and the argument there is that corporations because of the corporate form because of the limited liability that a corporation has um, and the entity status that a corporation has and footnote on this um, uh, for those of you at, who may not have taken a corporations class um, the limited liability is simply the idea that the shareholders of the corporation are not responsible for the debts of the corporation which makes it a lot easier for a corporation to raise money than for you or I to raise money because when people uh, buy shares in a corporation, they don't have to worry about being responsible for the obligations of the corporation. Their, their only exposure is the money they pay for their share um, of stock. So what Austin says is, uh, with respect to distortion, is that this dimension of the corporation, the fact that they can be used to raise large, large amounts of money, creates a risk of distortion in the political process, creates a risk that corporations will have more influence, will have disproportionate influence because of the special attributes of a corporation. What Citizens United said, what Kennedy said in Citizens United about this argument is that it doesn't apply because if you use this, uh, this logic, uh, or let me back up on it, um, not all corporations are big corporations that are raising lots of money. Um, some corporations are media corporations that are formed to promote um, speech and to, to speak. The anti-distortion rationale, by its terms, said the Supreme Court, would apply to them too, which doesn't make sense. 
For it also said that um, the anti-distortion rule would apply to closed corporations, small corporations that don't raise lots of money and don't um, raise the risk of distortion in the political process. So a key thing here, and with some of the other arguments in Citizens United, it seems to me, is the court uh, <coughs> is unwilling to distinguish among corporations. There's a, um, it, the, 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 one of the main moves in Citizens United is to say this, um, this rationale, a rationale is problematic if it does not apply to all corporations. If, if there's a set of corporations that this rationale doesn't make sense for, um, the rationale is problematic. And, and the anti-distortion argument um, is, is the biggest illustration of that. The second argument is that uh, corporations, there's a risk of, cor of corruption when corporations are involved in the political process. So there's, a, there's a risk that corporations will use their money um, to bribe politicians or to otherwise engage in quid pro quo um, corruption. Corruption where the corporation contributes money and gets something um, in return um, for it. What the Supreme Court says about that is that might be a problem in some context. That might be a problem if corporations are contributing directly to, um, to candidates. It's not um, a problem with independent expenditures where the, the contribution or it's, it's, uh, there's not enough of a direct link or a plausible link if what the corporation is doing is um, is uh, creating an ad for or against a particular um, um, candidate as opposed to contributing directly to the candidate. So uh, what Citizens United says is restrictions on direct contributions to candidates um, might be appropriate. And the Supreme Court case law so far suggests that they are appropriate, although there's some question uh, the, the Supreme Court has started to cut back on that a little bit. Um, already as well. Um, I forget where that sentence started, but uh, uh, so I'll just start a new sentence and say, uh, which is what I do in my classes. Uh, uh, it gets worse when I forget uh, what the content of the sentence was. Uh, uh, so the, the court says a campaign finance regulation based on corruption concerns might make sense with respect to direct contributions to candidates does not make sense with respect to other kinds of expenditures. And in Citizens United, uh, we're talking about other kinds of expenditures. Finally, there was an argument in Austin that campaign finance regulation is appropriate because of the, 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 the danger of corporate political involvement to shareholders of the corporation. And the particular concern was, if I'm a shareholder of a corporation, and my corporation uh, either contributes directly to a candidate or um, promotes the campaign of one candidate or one issue over another, I may not agree with what the corporation is doing. And it's problematic for the corporation to be taking positions in the political context that may be positions that some shareholders agree with, but there, there'll often be positions that other shareholders do not um, agree with. And so the concern here, or the argument here, is that campaign finance restrictions are shareholder protective. They, they protect shareholders whose dollars uh, or, or whose stake in the corporation may, may, may otherwise be used to promote positions that they don't agree with. So in a sense, the uh, corporate finance is justified on a shareholder, um, shareholder power basis um, if, and I've forgotten where this sentence has begun to, so, uh, so, or yeah, where this sentence began. So um, the argument is that, that uh, campaign finance regulation can be justified on a shareholder power basis um, on the view that it's protecting the speech rights of potentially dissenting shareholders, shareholders who might uh, disagree with what a corporation would do if it were to engage in, uh, in 
uh, campaign expenditures of one kind or another. What the, what the Supreme Court says about this is a couple of things. The first thing is, again, the over-inclusiveness argument, the same argument it makes with respect to the anti-distortion um, rationale. And the argument is, even if this were a problem, even if there were a danger of some shareholders um, having to tolerate speech they don't agree with, that's not a problem for media corporations, or if you applied this strictly, it would apply to media corporations, and we don't think it's permissible to silence media corporations. It's also not a problem for closed corporations. So the court says this rationale, too, is over-inclusive, and the court also says that if shareholders don't like what the corporation is doing with its campaign expenditures, they can use the corporate process to change things. They can vote out the directors who are engaging in the independent um, expenditures, or they can put in a rule that the corporation doesn't engage in independent expenditures. So um, Supreme Court, um, pretty dramatic decision, overrules one of its earlier cases, says, limitations on campaign expenditures, uh, independent expenditures by for-profit corporations violate the First Amendment. They violate the, the um, freedom of speech. Lots of other stuff in Citizens United as well, um, which we can talk about if you all want, but I want to focus on the parts that are, are most relevant for the points that I'm making. So reaction to the Citizens United decision, uh, many of you all probably remember this. It was just a couple weeks before President Obama's State of the Union address um, in 2010. President Obama said last week, the Supreme Court reversed a century of law that I believe will open the floodgates for special interests, including foreign corporations, to spend without limit in our elections. Um, Justice Alito um, was seen making funny faces and frowning and uh, whispering under his breath, not true, um, which um, created a lot of excitement. And a few months later, uh, Chief Justice Roberts was giving a, a talk, I think at the University of Alabama, and he said, the image of having members of one branch of government standing up literally surrounding the Supreme Court, cheering and hollering while the court, according to the requirements of protocol, has to sit there expressionless, I think, um, is very troubling. So uh, uh, Citizens United produced reactions somewhat similar to the reactions that Hobby Lobby um, produced. A lot of uh, excitement, and Citizens United obviously continues to uh, produce a lot of excitement. So, finally getting to the Hobby Lobby um, decision, uh, there are two main issues in Hobby Lobby, or there were two main issues in Hobby Lobby. The first one, which is the one I want to focus most on, although I'll say something about the second one as well, is, uh, is the question, can for-profit corporations have religious um, freedom rights? Um, and then the second question is, if for-profit corporations can have religious freedom rights or, or might have religious freedom rights, does the contraception mandate in Obamacare violate RIFRA, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act? Footnote on why RIFRA is the center of attention. Um, in a, a case called Smith, um, and Dale could tell us more about this, I forget, 1980, 81? 90, was it 90? Um, 1990, the Supreme Court um, really weakened, uh, many people believe, religious freedom um, rights by saying that they are subject to a generally applicable law. This was a case involving the smoking of, of peyote. Um, and religious freedom, uh, the Relig Re yeah, Religious Freedom Restoration Act was enacted by Congress to reinvigorate as Congress saw it, religious freedom um, rights. And so RIFRA turns out to be the key, um, the, the, the key legal basis for the Hobby Lobby um, decision rather than the, the First Amendment itself. Because the First Amendment it, um, by itself almost certainly would not have um, protected the two corporations that are, were involved in the Hobby Lobby decision. So um, two issues, uh, can for-profit corporations have religious freedom rights, and does the contraception mandate 
skin, Obamacare violates um, RFRA. Uh, the case involved two different closely held uh, for-profit corporations. One was Hobby Lobby, which gives its name to um, the opinion, which is a craft store. And the other was a store called uh, Conestoga Wood Products, I think, which is a woodworking cabinet um, making um, firm. Both of them are substantial corporations, um, but both are closely held. Both have just a handful of shareholders, mostly from the same family, and both are appear to be very religious in their orientation. And nobody doubted the sincerity of the religious beliefs. The particular um, objections were to four forms of contraception that are required to be covered by, uh, by Obamacare. Um, so on the RIFRA side of things, just, to, just briefly, the requirements of um, RIFRA um, are RIFRA protects a person exercising religious freedom, and that word per person turns out to be very important. Um, exercising religion also turns out to be fairly important. Um, uh, RIFRA kicks in if there is a substantial burden on the exercise of religion. If there is a substantial burden, the, the government needs to show that it has a compelling interest in the regulation in question. There's a compelling reason for the regulation despite its, uh, its burden on religious freedom. And if the government shows there's a compelling interest in the regulation, the question is whether what the government um, is doing, whatever accommodation it's making or, or, or whatever it's proposing to do with respect to the regulation, is the least restrictive means of, of, of achieving this compelling objective. And on the RIFRA analysis, well, a lot turns on, on the person part, which is what I'm going to, is part of what I'm going to talk about. Um, but the, the court focused primarily on the least restrictive means in the end. Um, it found that there was a substantial burden on these, uh, these uh, corporations' religious freedom rights and assumed that the government had a compelling interest for imposing the contraception mandate. And the, the issue on the RIFRA side of things was the least um, restrictive means. And I'll say a word about that, although I want to focus more on the first issue of for-profit corporations' religious freedom rights. Um, so this is the point where I get to, um, where I'll be slightly provocative, um, after boring you for uh, thir uh, for 40 minutes. And I'll, I'll try to be quick so you guys uh, can have some time to, uh, to ask questions um, before we call it quits. I personally think that Hobby Lobby is an easy case on the corporate law issue of can the um, can uh, for-profit corporations have relig religious freedom rights. I said this to uh, one of my colleagues a few weeks ago, and she just about bit my head off. Um, but um, and I think just because I was sta stating, stating it as I am here in such a crass way, um, saying that it's a, an easy case. Um, but I, I actually don't think it's a difficult case on the first issue in RIFRA, whether uh, for-profit corporations can have religious freedom rights. I mean, there are a couple of reasons, or three main reasons for that. One is that the operative term in RIFRA is exercise of religion by a person. It's a person um, exercising um, religion person routinely in the law, and I assume most of us in this room are law professors, lawyers, or law students, um, uh, so this is, this is not news for most of us in this room, person routinely means not just an individual, not just a flesh and blood person in the law, it routinely means um, partnerships, corporations, and other entities as well. Uh, almost everywhere in the law, when you see the word person, um, it means not just individuals, it also means corporations. And there's nothing that I've seen in the context of RIFRA itself that suggests person means something else. There are other laws that make clear they apply only, like some states have RIFRA-like have RIFRA statutes, and a couple of those statutes 
specifically say they apply to nonprofit corporations but not for profit corporations. RIFRA just says person, and person ordinarily means um, corporation as, as well as individual. The second reason I think it's, it's actually a pretty easy case on the first issue is many religious institutions are corporations. Um, most churches, many synagogues, are, um, are set up in a corporate form. And so um, to say that a, a for-profit corporation, it's hard to say that a for-profit corporation doesn't count as a person, while also saying that a nonprofit um, church can qualify um, as, um, as a person. Um, so that's another reason why it, uh, it seems pretty clear to me that a corporation is and ought to be a person under appropriate circumstances, and that's going to be the key, is, is how do you qualify. But under appropriate circumstances ought to be a person for RIFRA uh, purposes. The final, um, the, the final point, I think this is what Brett's made, um, is, it's probably made the others as well, um, is that um, corporate law is really flexible about what you can do with your corporation. You can set up your corporation and say, it is going to focus on anything you want it to focus on as long as that focus is lawful as long as you're not saying this corporation is going to violate the law. So you can set up a corporation and say, we are going to set up this corporation on religious principles, um, and that's going to guide everything we do. State corporate law invites you to do um, that sort of thing. And I'm going to say a little bit more about this um, at the end, which will be pretty soon. Um, so when you put these things together, um, it seems to me pretty clear that uh, that a corporation can be, under appropriate sort of for-profit corporation, can be a person for RIFRA uh, purposes. I should note that a number of um, very prominent law professors wrote an amicus brief that I'm happy to see. I was happy to see that Brett did not sign it, um, and nobody in this building signed it as best I could tell. Probably, I mean, maybe folks would have. Um, um, but uh, I did check that before I came. Uh, I'm not, I may be uh, inviting uh, inviting uh, attack, but I, you know, I'm a little careful about it um, at times. Uh, so the argument that the um, that the lawyers' brief made was that the values of shareholders don't simply pass through the corporation. So that there's a difference between the shareholders of the corporation and the corporation itself. And so the fact that the shareholders are themselves religious doesn't mean that the corporation is exercising religious freedom. Uh, so the, the, uh, the, lawyers, the law professor's brief says there's a difference between the shareholders and the corporation, um, which makes sense to me. I think they're right about this. Um, they also say that there is a significance to the separate entity of the corporation. It is distinct from the shareholders who formed and are shareholders of the corporation. I think this is right too, although it, it's a little messy with closely held corporations. Um, uh, courts often treat them as if they are a reflection of the views of the, the shareholders in the corporation. But my main, uh, my main concern with the law professor's brief is they really don't follow through the implications of their argument that the corporation has um, has its own personality. Uh, they, uh, they suggest that once you conclude that the corporation is not simply a mirror of its shareholders, that corporations can't have, can't exercise religion, which doesn't to me follow at all. You could have a corporation that's distinct from its shareholders that is set up on religious principles and is exercising religious freedom, of exercising the religious freedom that's shaped by its shareholders and shaped by its corporate documents, but shaped uh, by exercising re religious freedom um, nonetheless, it seems to me the law professor's brief makes sense for about half of the brief, um, and then stop, it completely stops making sense. And um, that's a reference to the talking heads. Um, and um, <laughs> I'm going back about 30 years. Uh, 30 years so. um, 
Uh, so it, it stops making sense, and it has to do with dance around um, around the fact that everybody agrees that a nonprofit church has religious freedom rights, even though it's a corporation. And, and um, law professors brief doesn't really deal with that very well. They also, at the end of the brief, talk about uh, if we allow corporations to have religious freedom rights, this will set up fights within the corporation. If one family member is religious, another family member is not religious, you'll have disputes. And so fighting that there are religious freedom rights um, runs the risk of encouraging disputes within the corporation. Um, my reaction to that is there may be disputes about religion. There can be disputes about anything within a closely held corporation, and religious freedom rights don't really change that. Uh, whether the corporation has religious freedom rights or not doesn't really seem to me to either increase or decrease the likelihood of um, disputes. Um, so a key limitation on the decision, I've, I've made the sort of strong claim, I think it's an easy case that corporations have religious freedom rights. It's important to point out this doesn't mean that, uh, it doesn't mean either that any given corporation is going to qualify or that, um, that RIFRA is going to protect the exercise, the particular exercise of those religious freedom rights. Um, one thing that some people have picked up on in the Hobby Lobby decision, but some people have not um, noticed as much as they should, is it's a pretty limited decision. Um, Justice Alito in Hobby Lobby says, he suggests it would be pretty easy for the government to fix the problem. The government um, created a compromise for nonprofit religious organizations, and Justice Alito suggested if you just made that compromise available to for profit corporations, probably uh, the contraception mandate stands up under RIFRA that you're, you're using the least restrictive means to achieve the compelling um, governmental in, uh, in interest. Um, and so the, the practical effect of Hobby Lobby, I think is fairly, um, fairly limited. The compromise says that if, if a uh, nonprofit religious organization objects to part of Obamacare, or the contraception mandate of Obamacare, they can they can sign a form saying they object, and then their insurance company has to um, to take over um, from there. Um, big question that a lot of people think about with respect to uh, to Hobby Lobby is: Does this mean that General Motors and IBM are going to start claiming to exercise religious freedom rights? Um, the answer to that question is no. I'm not, because in the interest of time, I'm not now going to go through these corporate theories. There's some kind of interesting um, uh, twists on them, I think, uh, for the purposes of this debate. But ju just make the more general point that for a for profit corporation, it's going to be really hard to demo, for a, a big for profit corporation, it's going to be really hard to show that you are religiously oriented. Um, if you have a certificate of incorporation, if, you, if your constitution has a provision that says we're operating on religious principles, I think that would probably do it. If your directors pass a resolution saying this corporation is operating on religious principles, that might do it. I think that's a little bit debatable depending on what your theory of the corporation um, is. The fact that the CEO of a corporation is really religious does not make the corporation religious. Um, and so a corporation to qualify as religiously oriented for RIFRA purposes is going to have to really actively create this, uh, this religiously oriented status. The number of publicly held corporations that um, currently do it is, is, is tiny. The number that would want to do it, I think, is really small. Because if you say, I'm a religiously oriented corporation, you're likely to scare away a fair amount of business. And, um, and a lot of corporations just don't want to do that. Interesting question to me whether Chick-fil-A, which is everybody's example of a Christian corporation, whether it would qualify for RIFRA purposes as a religiously oriented corporation. I don't think they have anything in their certificate of incorporation. I wasn't able to find it, um, but I don't think they have anything in their certificate saying they are religiously oriented. 
they actively promote their Christian values. So I think they might qualify as religiously oriented, but I think it's a little debatable with Chick-fil-A. 99.9% .9 of other big corporations are not going to qualify. So I don't think this is a huge um, a huge issue. Finally, why is uh, why is why are these results um, good for conservatives and good for liberals from a conservative point of view? Um, Hobby Lobby does suggest some limits on governmental oversight, that there is some protection um, from the reach of the state, which creates a space for a little more autonomy, uh, particularly for intermediate institutions. Not so much for individuals as for um, intermediate institutions like corporations, like churches, um, like uh, other organizations. There's also a discussion um, very, a very lively discussion right now in the academic literature about whether religion is special or not special. Hobby Lobby suggests a little specialness to religion under um, the Constitution. More surprisingly, why, why is Hobby Lobby uh, potentially beneficial from a liberal perspective? Um, one reason, it seems to me, is it underscores arguments that folks have made that corporations shouldn't focus solely on their profits. And this is something Brett has written a lot about. Um, there is a whole literature about the social responsibility of um, corporations that Brett is, is one of the leading figures in. Hobby Lobby is consistent with that. It's saying that a corporation can have a religious orientation, just as it can have an environmental orientation or, or some other kind of orientation. There's a new development, a recent development in corporate law, um, uh, and, and it's been passed in a number of states that involves what are known as benefit corporations. That if, you, if you're a benefit corporation, you explicitly adopt a, a, um, a social, um, a, uh, social responsibility mission for your corporation and you commit to having that mission audited over time, Hobby Lobby is really quite consistent with that kind of a development. Another benefit of Hobby Lobby, it seems to me, is it inherently suggests that all corporations are not the same. Um, so the logic of Citizens United was a logic that said um, any rationale that justifies um, limitations on corporate constitutional rights has to apply across the board to all kinds of corporations, not just big publicly held ones, also media corporations, also nonprofits. Hobby Lobby has a different kind of logic to it, and I think that logic might create a space for, um, for future campaign finance regulation that, that builds on the idea that different corporations have different personalities and ought to be treated differently um, by, uh, by the law. Finally, I think um, to the extent folks are, are seriously concerned about um, uh, the camp, uh, political involvement of corporations, thinking through Hobby Lobby um, along the kinds of terms I've been talking about suggests ways you might, within the corporate structure, limit um, the involvement of corporations in politics. And this could be broader than even independent expenditures. This could be political contributions generally. Um, the kinds of approaches people might think about are a check the box kind of approach, where a shareholder could uh, decide whether they want their portion of the um, of the, the corporation's treasury to go towards political contributions. It might uh, take the form of something like a shareholder vote requirement as a prerequisite for um, political contributions. So let me stop there. I've uh, not uncharacteristically gone on too far. We're gonna, uh, long, we're gonna easily make our one hour um, requirement. But do, do folks have questions? We have at least five minutes, maybe 10 minutes um, to make sure we get in our CLE hour. Um, questions on any of this? I talked really fast and said lots of different things. Sure. Um, let's see if I can find. This is what I. Um, 
this where I am, but yeah. So the reverse piercing theory, uh, so um, well, it requires a little bit of a background. I suspect you know what veil, 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 veil piercing is. So, uh, um, so, uh, so piercing the corporate veil is an exception to the general rule that shareholders are not responsible for the obligations of the corporation. So if, if shareholders misbehave, if they abuse the corporate form, a court might pierce the corporate veil and allow creditors of the corporation to sue, uh, to sue a shareholder. That's veil piercing. Reverse veil piercing, which is much rarer than veil piercing, um, is uh, goes from the shareholder to the corporation, and the idea is that um, that and I'm going to forget exactly how it um, uh, how it works. That um, yeah, I'm going to forget exactly. I'm going to forget exactly how it works in the case law. It it's a um, it's a limitation of the corporate structure so that the the shareholder is treated as indistinguishable from the corporation. And I forget exactly what the context is. I think it's typically in the context of fraud. Um, so it's, it's a weird appli uh, cap application here. Um, so I'm not really answering your, your specific question very well, because I can't remember what the doctrine means. But the way it is used in this context is uh, it's an argument for um, for the corporation having the personality of the shareholder, it's it's an argument for um, for treating the corporation as an extension of, of, of the shareholder. The lawyer's brief, um, or the law professor's brief, attacks this rationale and says this doesn't really make any any sense. I actually agree with them um, about that. Why I had it on this slide was um, a, a prominent corporate law scholar named Steve Bainbridge has a theory of corporate law that is a director privacy theory. His theory of corporate law is that shareholders should not have a lot of power. Directors should be able to make all the relevant decisions for the firm. Steve has also argued with respect to Hobby Lobby that we ought to use a, a reverse veil piercing kind of approach, an approach that treats the corporation as an extension of the shareholder. One of the points I, I wanted to make here is there's a real tension between those two things. Um, Steve, in his corporate law scholarship, says we should really honor the corporate form. Directors should be one, the ones making the decision. Then Hobby Lobby comes along, a case that Steve happens to agree with, and he says, oh, we should dust off this old doctrine called reverse veil piercing and uh, treat the corporation as an extension of the shareholders. It's a really rare doctrine. I think it has no real ap application here, and um, that's maybe reflected in the fact that I can't remember exactly what the, um, what the specific, it somehow has to do with the fraud context. Does anybody here know? Um, Brett just left, so I had to leave, so I bet he would, um, he would know. The only I've that's heard the only case I ever came across it in, but I, I've heard this argument before that that's what was happening in Hobby Lobby. So well, the, and, it's, and the, the reason it came up is because Steve Bainbridge wrote a clever little article. It, actually, the article was before the Hobby Lobby case, saying uh, we ought to conclude that corporations have, for-profit corporations can have religious freedom rights on a reverse veil piercing. Um, theory. Nobody had ever heard of it. Steve dusted it off. And the lawyer's brief criticizes, I think, I think rightly so. I don't think it has any, appli any application. I think the argument for religious freedom rights is an argument that a, a corporation can have any personality you, you want to give it. Um, and that's consistent with the way that we have conceived religious freedom. We've never limited it just to individuals. We've all, always thought that at least some associations can have religious freedom rights, and, and to me, that logic extends to for profit corporations. Other questions? 
I think the Hobby Lobby case, the rationale of the Hobby Lobby case to apply to all corporations, <laughs> not just closely held ones, you've articulated practical reasons why it might not apply to General Motors. But do you read the rationale not to apply? No, I read it absolutely as applying. And so what, I, what I'm trying to do, I'm trying to do uh, what I often do, which is to, to make a dramatic statement, a dramatic provocative statement, and then back, walk it back just a little bit. Um, and so the, the, the dramatic provocative statement would be, no matter how big the corporation is, Apple could be a religiously oriented corporation if it wanted to become a religiously oriented uh, corporation. So that's the dramatic um, statement. The walk back is, that you can't just issue a press release saying we've decided to, to exercise religious freedom rights. That you have to, it has to be wired into the corporation itself. With small corporations, courts, uh, small corporations tend to be run in a fast and loose way, and courts tend to be sympathetic to that, and so they don't require small corporations to be quite as formal. Um, about the way they do things. So a small corporation could possibly be religiously oriented, even if their constitutional documents don't say they're religiously oriented, if they make really clear that they are, as Hobby Lobby and Conestoga um, did. With a large corporation, courts always require adherence to formalities. You gotta have director's meetings, you gotta pay attention to your, your constitutional documents. And so, in my view, for a large corporation to be religiously oriented, that it would have to be religiously oriented as a matter of corporate formality. So the, the clearest way would be to put in your certificate of incorporation a provision that says we're religiously oriented, and to act consistently with that. I mean, if you didn't, I think you could lose it. So, um, so in a way, there are two limitations. One limitation is uh, a big corporation can't accidentally become religiously oriented. Just because you have a really devout CEO does not make you religiously uh, oriented. You have to make it public and formal within the corporate process. The other is you have to adhere to it. So that if um, one of the things the lawyer, the law professor Free says is a corporation could, could, um, could be worried about some law today, and so it could immediately pass a board resolution saying we're a religious um, uh, corporation, so we're exempt from this law. That would be opportunistic, and, and the court would say that's not a sincere, uh, uh, sincere manifestation of, of religious belief. So both of those are significant limitations, I think, the formal limitation and the sincerity um, uh, limitation. So I don't, I think it, it's gonna be a tiny number of corporations, of big corporations, that would ever consider be, becoming religiously oriented. Um, but I do think the logic extends to, to public company corporations. Just thank you, Mr. Steele. Uh,